Hey, everybody, this is Jeremiah Craig. Welcome to another episode of Ask the Bootmaker. Today, I have the legend Dina McGuffin in the house. How's it going, Dina? Thank you so much for being today's guest. It's going great today. Thank you. And I'm so happy to be here. <laughs> it is incredible to have you here uh, for the first Ask the Bootmaker of 2023. And uh, I haven't done one of these interviews for a while, so we're kicking it off uh, right away here, and we're kicking off strong with uh, such a great guest like you. So thank you for your time. I'm wondering if you can get us started here just by giving us your origin story and how you got into boot making to begin with. Well, my father is was a boot maker and uh, grew up in a, a boot shop, boot and shoe repair shop in Roswell, New Mexico. and of course, he tried to teach me leather craft and stuff when I was young, but I just didn't have the patience for it. Uh, you know, I wanted that instant gratification and you don't get that with <laughs> this kind of work. And uh, so I went off and did a lot of other things. And years later, uh, my ex-sister-in-law just got all over me one time when I saw her. She said, what is the matter with you? Here's this man that has this exceptional craft that is a dying art. Why aren't you learning that? And I kind of got to thinking about it. And I thought, well, you know, she's right about that. So I, I talked to my dad about it. And of course, his first reaction was, oh, well, girls just aren't strong enough to do this kind of work. And I was like, well, you know, I've been doing, uh, you know, branding cattle and doing that kind of stuff and doing construction work and things like that. I think I've got enough strength to do this. I said, you, you let me worry about that. You just teach me. And it took me a year to talk him into it. And I think he finally agreed because my ex-husband and I divorced and I think he thought he needed to bring me and my daughter home to take care of us, you know? And I don't think he ever really thought I'd do it, but I surprised him. Oh, so I'm sorry, I thought I turned off all my stuff. Oh, no worries, no worries. So uh, your, your, it started with your father and then uh, did, he inspire you after the fact when you got into it? Uh, did did you, he help you and inspire you through the boot making process and helping you learn how to how to do that? Oh yes, uh, I spent three years with him, and he he came kind of came from the background. My grandfather was not a full fledged boot maker. Kind of back in those days, uh, they had top makers and bottomers, you know, and. He had a, a shop, well, his first shop was in Carrizozo, New Mexico in 1917, and then later they moved to Roswell. But back then they used to order the tops from Blue, uh, Blucher and Olson Stelzer and stuff like that, and then they just put the bottoms on them. And my father went to Portales to e &MU University. In fact, he, he went the first year when it was a junior college. And he worked for a bootmaker there named John Skinner. And it was kind of their deal that John would teach him to make boots. Well, of course, back in those days, guys weren't so eager to teach because they saw everybody as competition. So he just kind of wanted him to do the repair work and sweep up the shop and everything. And he didn't really spend much time teaching him. And so dad just kind of watched over his shoulder and everything. So he was pretty much a self-made top maker he of course he knew bottom construction because he grew up in a shoe shop and shoe doing shoe repair and boot repair and then later when after he and mom married and lived in roswell he worked in the boot shop and they made stock sizes just to put on the shelves that the ranchers came in and bought and back then they were charging 12.50 a pair for boots. <laughs> That's twelve dollars and fifty cents. Yes, <laughs> I, I can't imagine it. Even when I was learning, I was like, "Oh my God, that you got to be kidding!" <laughs> <laughs> How times have changed, eh? <laughs> yes, indeed. So he, so your father, uh, sort of learned the top making and top stitching, maybe some inlay, um from his job interning, basically sweeping up the shop here and there, just by soaking it up through um, just watching uh, his mentor? Pretty much. He wasn't wow. really given any formal uh, formal training. And, you know, that's 
but I tell you what, he was probably one of the best top makers I've ever seen. I mean, you, I, I always loved lasting his tops because they just go on so easy, you know, and they fit just perfectly on the last and everything. And, you know, it took me years to kind of fine tune my stuff from, from what he taught me that it worked well for him. You know, it's like cutting the draft out. He just eyeball it. He just lay his little draft pattern down there and cut it. And he also added an inch on on each side for the side seams. And when I do that, I get my throats way too big. So I finally had to modify it and add three quarters of an inch. And then every, every size that I make, I have a little template pattern that I've made for the, for the draft where I set my draft template you know, to cut it so I could get it right. <laughs> but he just would eyeball stuff. He was, he was an amazing boot maker. Wow. So what was that relationship like with your father in the in the shop um where did he start you out on uh when he taught you how to do it did he teach measuring first did he teach you top stitching first what was the what was your growth like um while under your father learning from him well there were two kind of two prong approach there we he had a home shop and we opened it up to the public as a repair shop so we'd have something to work on and also to teach me and also help defray the cost of my <laughs> of my apprenticeship, you know, uh, help us make a little money there. And uh, then we just started in and started on a pair of boots, made a pair of boots, start to finish. But, you know, it was over, over time. And um, so then I, I was so uh, fortunate, I was able to spend three years in that little shop with him before I opened my own shop in Clovis, which was like 19 miles away. And I was there for nine years. So I still had his expertise available to me a short drive away. You know, if I ran into a problem, I could just load it up and take it down to his shop and he'd help me figure it out. So it, wow. was, it was very amazing. And I feel it, I feel really fortunate that I was able to learn my craft from him because he was such an amazing boot maker. Yeah, that sounds really special. Did he now when you left um his apprenticeship and started your own shop, did he see that as like a uh competition sort of uh uh perspective where you became the pers the competition or was there enough business for everybody to be happy? No, by that time, I mean, he, he just had his shop as a little home shop before I came back. He was not open to the public, you know, and so he was quite ready to go back to, to that. I mean, he still made a few pairs of boots and did a little repair work for his friends and stuff, but he was no longer open to the public, you know. So he was pretty proud of you for stepping out on your own and opening up your own shop. Well, I think he was. Everybody else would say, oh, your dad has such good things to say. But I think I'd been making boots for 10 years before he ever said, you know, you're a good boot maker, but <laughs> you always had that but in there. You know? <laughs> well, I think that's just the fatherly way, right? <laughs> <laughs> so now you have your own custom boot, boot shop still today. And a large part of your business is uh, bringing students in and teaching and sharing what you learned from your father or maybe what you learned yourself with students today. Um, have you brought anything over from how your father taught you to how you teach your students or have you developed a new teaching style altogether? Well, I think it's a combination of both. You know, the basics and everything, I, I teach pretty much the way he taught. And, and I tell all of my students, I'm going to show you how to do it. And I want you to learn how to do it exactly how I'm doing it. But if you need to hold this tool differently or that tool differently, and you get the same result that I'm getting, I don't care. <laughs> you know, just so long as you understand the process and what we're doing here, you know, and everybody will, you know, uh, take what they learn and, and make it their own. You know, I've changed some of his techniques a little bit and 
my students have changed some of mine and made it their own and, and everything. So, you know, you just got to be ready for them to do that and, and let them do that. That's part of the learning process. I worked for a woman in Austin one time in a leather shop and she just insisted that I do everything exactly the way she did it. And I'd already been working leather and carving leather and stuff for, you know, several years. And, you know, as long as she was in the shop, I'd do it the way she said. When she left, I'd do it my way and she never knew <laughs> the difference. <laughs> this sounds about right. Uh, <laughs> now, I have a question concerning your students and your Instagram account. So you're there in New, Be in New Mexico still today, correct? Yes. So on your Instagram, you frequently share photos of your students, you know, flipping the bird, um, <laughs> the old middle finger, you know, during a particular process of the boot making. Um, <laughs> can you explain that tradition and what, what <laughs> makes that process uh, so upsetting to everybody on your Instagram? <laughs> Well, uh, it's the process of sewing welts. And if anybody's ever made a pair of boots, they understand it. Sewing welts is probably, uh, it's not rocket science. It's nothing hard to learn, but it's, it's difficult to do when you're first starting out. Once, once you kind of understand what you're doing and you get, it's a rhythm thing with it, you know? And so most people have a really hard time doing it. And one of my students, <laughs> Russell Conte was his, is his name, and we're dear friends to this day. And he was the one that started the tradition. I said something about, I came in and said, well, how are you doing? And this is what I got, you know? And I said, oh, do that again, and took his picture. <laughs> he was the first one to go up on Instagram with it. And I've only had one student that didn't want to do it. And, you know, it was a, I think it was a religious belief, so I respected that and didn't ask her to do it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I always get a smile on it every time I see it, um, because I can always expect it whenever I see that you have a new student in your shop. <laughs> oh, yeah. How's this one going to be this time? I did get a comment on Instagram one time, kind of a, well, why are you doing that? That's kind of awful to do. <laughs> I was like, well, it's my tradition, so there you have it. <laughs> <laughs> I love the tradition. That's your problem. They don't have a sense of humor. <laughs> right. I want to remind everybody watching right now, thank you for tuning in. You can ask uh, Dina McGuffin a question in the live chat if you have them. And if I see it, I will uh, come through and uh, ask Dina your question. And we just got one from Neil over in Scotland. Um, yep. And he asks... How long does it take to teach someone to make boots? Uh, well, Neil, uh, uh, welcome. And I'm glad you're watching from Scotland. I went to Scotland several years ago and I'd love it there. And I'd love to go back. But uh, my course is a two week course. It's very intensive. We do the top making the first week and, and then do the bottom work the second week. And hopefully by the end of the week, we're done. Uh, sometimes it, it goes over a little bit and we have to to work a little longer and everything but that's just a basic basic uh uh time and we make one pair of boots so uh, it's a very intensive course and there's a lot to learn and i encourage everybody now that we have cell phones that have picture uh, photo capability and video capability to take lots and lots of pictures and stuff uh, in the, in the early days when we didn't have that, of course, it was all handwritten notes and everything. And it was just a little bit harder to, to keep it all in mind. It still is hard. And I think sometimes my course ends up being more of an answer to whether you really want to be a bootmaker or not, <laughs> you know, and, and say, oh, wow, this entails a lot more than I ever thought it did, you know. And, is measuring part of that process too and building up the last? Yes, absolutely. That's our, our first day is measuring and pattern making for the tops of the boots and cutting out the boots and stuff like that, you know. And uh, by the end of the first week, while the boots are drying or something, then that I use that time to pick out the last and start the 
the last fitting process. So you learn how to fit the last and the whole nine yards. Wow. Two weeks seems just jumping right in real fast because I know some custom boot makers uh, take much longer to build a pair of boots. Well, of course I do too when I'm making a pair. I don't even make a pair in two weeks. The The shortest time I've ever made a pair was six days, uh, but that was really a bunch of hard work. Um, but uh, it's that's what it takes to to actually make a pair, but it is a very intense two weeks. And like I say, most people have no earthly idea what they're getting themselves into when they start. I mean, they come and they, they we get through the first week and they've struggled with the machinery and, you know, sewing and doing all this stuff. And then we start the second week and that's a whole different process, whole different skill set, whole different tools, whole different leather, you know, it's it's really there are two skills to it and i that after i started teaching it really made me realize why they used to do have top makers and bottomers because they're really kind of two different skills so yeah that makes sense now i want to hear about this pair of boots that you made in six days what was what's the story behind that <laughs> well <laughs> At my friend Russell again, uh, he and I have done uh, a video on a, a boot making course on video. And he was he was shooting that video. And that's what we did. We don't have it ready for, for publication yet. It's, it's in the can and hopefully it'll be out this year. And uh, so that that's what prompted that he he's a busy fellow and that's about all the time he had <laughs> so we got it done <laughs> wow so this happened really recently then yes wow that sounds so difficult to do something uh with that much detail in so little time uh i'm gonna come back here to the live chat and uh continue on with some of these questions you guys have some great questions. If anybody just joined us, remember that you can ask Dina questions in the live chat. We have one here from Smack Daddyus. What is your favorite toe shape and heel shape? Um, maybe uh, top heights as well. Some of your favorite uh, ones to make. Well, my favorite uh, toe is the little square undercut toe. The traditional uh, people, some people call it a snip toe. A very narrow one, you know. The uh, box toe? Yeah. Like a half inch box toe? Oh, yeah. Or maybe even, yeah, half inch, three quarter, something nice. like that. Three quarter, probably. Half, half's pretty small. And I've gone to uh, making a little larger ones here of late, <laughs> you know, the, the wider ones. And I like those. And I, I like the riding heel uh, style, you know. I like a nice, just a, a nice shape on the heel. I don't like a big old blocky heel. Mm -hmm. Classic. I, lo I love those those as well. Great question. Thank you. Um, thank you. Thank you. We have one here from um, Tomislav from Croatia. Uh, oh. It is, what is the most difficult part of the boot to make? Is that the welts? Uh, coming back to it, the sewing on the welts, or is there something more difficult for you and your students? Oh, I think I think probably the most difficult part of it is the fit, is getting the fit right and learning how to fit. Uh, you know, that's that's a whole different thing. You know, um, and my dad always had a saying. He said, "People don't lie, but their feet do." <laughs> and you know, you uh, if a person's foot is very fleshy. It'll squish up more if it's really bony. Then you want to make those make them right up to their measurements. But like I say, if they're if they're fleshy, you might want to back off on the measurements just a little bit because it, it's going to have a little squishiness to it and squish up a bit, you know. And uh, so it's it's just kind of a matter of learning feet. And you know, I I only take four measurements. There's a lot of people out there that take a lot more and do a lot more things, but that was what I was taught to do. And so I've just run with that, how I've, I've learned to do it. 
I had a gentleman come to me, oh, probably 10 years or so ago that suffered gout and diabetes. And he just, there was no way in the world he could get a pair on off the rack, you know. And boy, his little feet just looked like sausages. And that was before the days of, of you know, that I had a good camera on my phone and I couldn't even take a picture of his foot. But for some reason, I just had a, a vision of his foot in my mind and I just worked with the last. And then at one point, it, I just felt that, that it was right. And I left it there and I made the guy two pairs of boots. He put boots on and almost cried because he could wear boots again. And it was probably the most rewarding pairs of boots I ever made. They weren't fancy. They were just plain Jane boots. But this man was not able to wear them, uh, wear boots otherwise. So it was a success. <laughs> That's so special to give somebody the spiritual experience like that when they slip into a pair of boots, when they can't find something that fits. Does that happen often to you or are there just times that stick out more than others like um, the pair that you made this uh, man? Oh, there's a few that stick out more than others, you know. Uh, it's just kind of the way it is. That wouldn't in particular, but yeah. It's, it's always really nice whenever I can get a good fit on somebody and you're so happy with them. And that's what we all strive for. That's what we want, you know, and, uh, and I sweat it every time to this day. <laughs> you know, I never really am totally sure until they put them on. <laughs> what do they call it? The bootmaker's prayer? Please fit, please flip, please fit. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> Well, speaking of uh, the uh, fit and uh, the other aspects that go into boots, I had a question here that I prepared for this uh, this interview, and it's like uh, boot making is special in that it fuses the functional quality, the fit, the math, and also the creative artistry. Uh, which aspect of the boot making do you enjoy more? Do you find yourself really spending some time thinking about the fit, the art? both a little bit more like where is where are, do you land on that scale oh artistry is my thing you know i mean all the rest of it is important but i i really do love the artistry and you know i my signature boots are my day of the dead boots and those are probably the most extravagant artwork that i've ever done um this is the day of the dead it's got the, the gal on the front and there's the guy on the back and they're different the other one the guy's on the front and the gal's on the back and of course here at the top we have you know two different uh colors on our top beating and it it switches on this side everything and the same on the other one you know so i mean it's it's this kind of work that i've always really really loved doing Wow. And the skirt on the uh, on the front of that, on the skeleton of the front, the Day of the Dead, uh, does that like, is that like a pinching roses technique? Because it seemed to come out a little bit. Um, how did you do that? Can you show that again to, to well, the viewers? Actually, I didn't design that. One of my students did. She was a oh. seamstress. She is a seamstress. And it's gathered, just like you'd gather a, a skirt uh, that, that you made with fabric. You know, I sent her the, the size of, of where I needed that to fit. I said, I'm just having a terrible time figuring this skirt out, do something. And this is what she sent me back. And I was like, wow. this is perfect. <laughs> wow, that is so awesome. I, I love that design. And then the rest of it is inlay? Yes. Well, it's all a combination of inlay and overlay. There's more. This is about the only overlay. Uh, this and, and her hat up here. Now, the guy here, we've got quite a bit. We've got the guitar here that is an overlay, but and then the, the skeleton is an inlay, but here the arm comes out over the guitar, and here the up, up here on the neck, the, the hand comes out, you know, on the guitar neck, and then, of course, his sombrero. Wow. Is inlaid and overlaid. The sombrero itself is inlaid and then sewed on. So, I mean, I have about 100 hours just in the inlay work in this pair of boots. I'm not surprised. For all the viewers who might be new to cowboy boots, can you explain the difference between inlay and overlay? 
Well, an inlay, you actually cut the cut a hole in the in the top of the the leather here. Let's use this. Well, here. I've got another pair here. This is a pair of my dad's, and this is a very traditional design, inlay design. This is probably the last pair of fancy boots he ever made, you know. Wow. Uh, and this is all inlay work here. So the white is cut out, and then the navy is inlaid behind that, and then this is cut out, and the maroon is inlaid behind that. Now, the, the collar here is an overlay. But so it's the, on top. It's on top, yes. And I have done some boots that have applique, what I call an applique, which is an overlay that goes over the top, you know, rather than an inlay to get the same kind of design. But this is this is wh wh where I learned my boot making. And look at this little detail right here where on this side seam where he spliced blue in here onto the white. So it'd be blue here and white wow. up here. Wow. Instead the, of blue, blue all the way up or or white all the way up. This is the kind wow. of craftsman my dad was. And, you know, he just had this classic design, you know, and that's the little snip toe right there. And of course his heel, that's very much, he was a, a real dressy guy and he liked a really small rand and this pair was the soles aren't even stitched because he liked such a narrow welt on there that he said, oh, with the cement we have these days, why worry about stitching them anyway? They're not coming apart. And he liked that really narrow look because he was a dapper guy. <laughs> wow, I guess so. Those are beautiful. They're amazing. Thank you for sharing that. Um, we got a question here from uh, Thomas Barrett. And he asks, what is your process for welting around the toe? Uh, he's tried a few methods to get the welt flat during uh, welting versus after, uh, some more effective than others. Well, th it, that's, that's kind of a hard thing all the way around. Of course, it depends on the size of your toe. If you've got a big round toe, it's not usually an issue. On these little square toes like this, though, it can be. And the... The thing that you need to do, when when I sew my welts, I always pull the welt really tight when I'm sewing up the sides. But when I get up to, say, uh, right about here on the toe, can you see that right, right in here, kind of? Yes. When you get up to there, then you just relax it a little bit. When you get around to the Ed, edge of the toe here then you actually start pushing the welt back a little bit so it 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 makes it easier to go around that well you know when you when you go around here and you push it back a little bit it gives you a little easement there so then you can flip it down and get it straight and then you pull it tight around the toe like around the front again and then well, same process well, coming I, back i i keep it i keep I keep it loose up to about up to about here. Then I start pushing back on it all the way around to this other side. Then I let it just go naturally for a little bit. And then I start tightening it up again to go back. Awesome insights. Try that. See if it'll work. Awesome insights, Thomas, that you can only get here on Ask the Bootmaker. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Thomas has a follow-up question about uh, wetting the welt. Do you wet the welt also during that process? Absolutely. I soak it in a bucket. I want everything when I sew welts, I want my insole very wet and I want the welt very wet because you you need it because that's, you know, that's what makes the welt pliable. You try to sew it dry. Whew, I don't think I've ever sewed a dry welt. I wouldn't know. <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. Thank you so much for that question, Thomas. And great answer, Dina. Uh, speaking of uh, boot making, uh, we finally got to meet in person at uh, the Wichita Falls Boot and Saddle Maker Roundup. And I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, women professionals in custom cowboy boot space, because uh, when we were down there in Wichita Falls, uh, there were 
definitely a few women bootmakers. Uh, and of course, Holly Henry won the uh, journeyman yeah. category. Uh, but, you know, what do you think is the current state of women in the bootmaking profession? Oh, I think there's a, a lot of women up and coming now and, and boot making and shoe making, just uh, footwear manufacturer, period. Uh, there's a little Zoom meeting that takes place the, of women in the business once a month or something like that, that you know, I've seen a time or two. Uh, and I'm really glad to see it, you know, because when I started making boots, uh, myself and Melody Dawkins were probably the first women to get into actual the whole the whole realm of boot making making the entire boot traditionally there were a lot of women who did top work their husbands were boot makers or they worked for boot makers uh, Lisa Sorrell got her start like that being a top maker uh, and uh, of course she went on to become an incredible boot maker but uh, this was like back I started my apprenticeship with my dad in 1982 and I only met one other woman that was even in the trade and she was uh, working for Willie Lusk in Lubbock, Texas at that time. She was a top maker. And uh, I, I'm sure there were probably women boot makers out there. You just never heard of them. And it wasn't an easy business to break into. Uh, a lot of those older guys were not real happy that there was a gal doing what they were doing, you know, and um, I never really let that bother me. I mean, I'd been in uh, non-traditional professions all my life, just about. Uh, and so I just went ahead and did my thing and, and went on about my business. You know, I've had, I had one guy walk into my shop in Clovis and said, I want to talk to the boot maker. I said, I'm talking to her, or you're talking to her. And he walked out. <laughs> so I was like, well, I don't want to measure your stinky old feet anyway. <laughs> so... <laughs> <laughs> you know, I just, I, it was hard, uh, but, you know, I just hung in there and, and did what I wanted to do and didn't worry about it. And, and I'm really glad to see now, though, that there are a lot more women in the business. And I'm glad to see that they're uh, being welcomed a little easier and, and uh, that people honor them a bit more than they did back in our day. <laughs> do you think there's still space for improvement? Sure, there always is. You know, uh, we still struggle with that. You know, the younger generations, of course, coming up are getting better and better and better with it. You know, my grandson's generation, these boys, particularly homeschool boys like he was, they all grew up competing with men of color and women, well, boys of color and, and girls throughout their whole life. So it, it doesn't it phase them. They're quite used to it and they're okay with it. But, you know, breaking those old traditions is take some time sometime. 100%, 100%. Thank you for sharing your thoughts on that. I completely agree. Um, and also when we were at Wichita Falls, um, you were handing out flyers uh, concerning uh, the sale of your uh, boot shop and your company. And I was kind of curious about that when you, when you were handing out those flyers. Now, what does that mean exactly? Are you just selling the shop equipment? Are you selling the name or like, are you expecting somebody to buy everything that, that you've built over the past, uh, over the many years that you've built this, and this, uh, this shop and this school, and then continue to make boots under the MacGuffin custom boot name? Like what does no. the sale of your shop entail? Uh, it's, it's the sale of the boot shop to be moved. Okay. Uh, and entails everything that you walk out of here with everything that you need to make boots with or, or shoes or footwear, equipment, tools, glass, uh, materials, uh, findings, you know, workbenches, <laughs> all kinds of stuff. Uh, I've been doing this 40 years now. I turned 73 this, I will turn 73 in a couple of weeks. And um, I've got arthritis in my hands and it's getting just harder to do this work. This is hard physical labor and it's particularly uh, hard on your hands and your upper body strength, you know, and all that stuff. And it's really my hands that are, are bothering the most now. And so um, 
you know, I'm, I'm just going to have to, I'm going to have to retire. I don't have to, but I want to, because I mean, I can begin to see my, my skills slipping a little bit just because I don't have the hand coordination and the eye hand coordination and everything that I used to have when I was younger. I'll still do leather work. Uh, I'll, I'm, you know, I'll have certain machines and stuff that I keep, but that and my hand tools and carving tools and all that stuff. So I'll still do leather work, but I just I, I don't have the fire in the belly for it anymore. I love it and it's been good to me. And um, I'm sure that it, I'll probably make another few pairs in my life, you know, but I just don't want to do it as a living anymore. I will miss uh, teaching. That's been a lot of fun, and I've really, really enjoyed it, and I've been extremely blessed to, to have had some incredible students and some people that have just been a delight to work with, and uh, I'm going to miss that, but uh, I think it's time to turn a, a new leaf and do a little something different in my life. Yes, I mean you made a huge impact on the uh, on the industry from from my perspective looking from the outside in um and i know you've you've really inspired a lot of folks to make boots uh, especially from what i've heard uh from the man himself west Schugert of uh music city leather um i mean he has nothing but good things to say about you all the time oh west and i had a great time and we're still uh good friends to this day and um, you know he's he's turned into an incredible boot maker. Uh, he he makes some beautiful boots, and I'm I'm very proud of him and proud of his work. And he's he's so funny. He's taken several of my patterns and butched them up a little bit, manned them up, you know. But it is great. I love to see that. I'm like you know this is great. You know he he's took what I taught him and he made it his own. And, you know, several other people have too. Uh, Emily at Underhill Leather is, is uh, one of my students. And uh, gosh, I, I, if I slide anybody on Instagram, please excuse me because I can't remember everybody off the top of my head. But um, yeah, there's a, there's a lot of, of great boot makers out there and Wes is definitely one of them. Yes, for sure. Uh, now, for everybody interested in uh, maybe purchasing uh, your shop and the equipment, what sort of equipment do you have and how would that uh, transfer transfer to um, their ability? Like, uh, for, I don't, I don't understand anything about the um, the equipment that it takes to make boots or how, maybe older equipment is better than newer equipment or vice versa. Can you sort of explain the equipment that you have up for sale and how it is the best for boot making possibly? Well, I don't know the difference between the old and the new because I've always just used the old one I've got. So I, I can't really tell you there. I'm sure some of the new stuff is, is better. You know, uh, of course I have a line finisher. I've got the old Landis 450 line finisher. It's like 14 feet long and, you know, you got to have some space to put it in. I have a, a Landis L stitcher, sole stitcher, and I use that to side up my tops. A lot of people use a harness machine to do that, but I learned to do it on the Landis, so that's what I use. And of course, you have a, a splitter and a five in one, and um, my top machines. You know, I've got a, a 3115 Singer, old 3115 Singer, that's a great machine. And then I've got a an artisan post machine. I have a bell skiver that's become essential to me now that my hands hurt so bad because skiving is one of the things that's really, really hard on your hands. And uh, so I have that. Of course, I have lasts and hand tools and, mm -hmm. and jacks and jack stands and all kinds of stuff. I've got a lot of pre-cut boot parts, you know, so. So somebody purchasing your shop is ready to go with their own shop immediately. Absolutely. Absolutely. They could get everything moved in, set up and start making boots as soon as they're set up. And how would somebody uh, contact you? What's the best way to reach out to you to inquire about possibly buying your shop? 
Well, just Instagram is good. You know, message me on Instagram and then we'll we'll connect and I'll send you the information and we'll get in touch. Perfect. I'll uh, of course have pictures of everything so I can send all kinds of pictures of the equipment and you know what what's here. I'll link up your Instagram after this. So if anybody is interested, it'll be down in the description um, and you can contact Dina directly through Instagram. We got some more uh, questions here from the live chat. Another one from uh, Tom Tomislav. Uh, do you think boot making is in good hands considering the future and students? Yes, I, I think it is. <clears throat> in fact, I've, I've been really delighted in, in the last, oh, say five, six years. Uh, a lot of young people are, are beginning to learn boot making and shoe making. There's a lot of people in footwear making right now. And um, the last few years at Wichita Falls at the boot contest there, I've been so impressed with the quality of the work that these young boot makers are putting out. Uh, I'm I, back in my day, you know, there were some good boot makers and there were some mediocre boot makers. But boy, nowadays, there are some really good boot makers out there, young ones that haven't made that many pairs of boots, you know, and they're really doing beautiful work. Yeah, I, I put up a video about um, not only the winners of the uh, contest this past year, but also um, showing showing many of the uh, boots that were just on the table in general, and they were all very, very, very nice. Like just down to the smallest details, um, it's really, really exciting to see it. And I'm looking forward to going back next year. And I'm only expecting it to get even better. Oh yeah, it's it's gotten better and better every year. Uh, you know, like I say, they're used to, particularly in the journeyman category, there used to be some pretty rough boots in that category. But now, you know, I didn't see any of them that were really rough. They, there were some of them that needed some improvement, all right, but they weren't rough. You know, they were, they were nice boots. Yeah, it looked like a tough uh, category even then. And you had a student in the journeyman category this year as well, didn't you? Yes, Jeremy Brown. Yeah, he, I thought he made a really nice pair of boots. He had a pair in last year as well. Mm -hmm. And well, <laughs> I really thought he should have won that one. But <laughs> that was Th my this year's favorite. or last year's? Well, last year's for sure. And I, mm -hmm. I thought he had a good chance this year. Me too. And Wes that was won close. Several times. And I've had a couple of other students win. So. I got another question here from Neil uh, as we are talking about Wichita Falls and the boot contest there. Uh, do you think you will continue being involved in the boot making community after you sell the shop? Like, will you continue going to the uh, contest, the conference there or being involved in other ways? Oh, sure, as long as I can. Uh, uh, I love that community. And it, it, to me, Wichita Falls is more like family reunion than it is an expo. You know, I just, love going and seeing everybody and, and visiting with everybody again, you know. And over the last few years, we've lost some of the older boot makers. And, and uh, you know, I think it's important to go every year that you can. It is for me because I still want to see the people that I might not see the next time, you know. You don't mm -hmm. know that. And um, I, I really enjoy it. I like seeing the work that people are doing. I like meeting the new people that are coming into the business and it's just a fun time for me i'm kind of an old recluse here at home you know and i don't get out a whole lot so it's real nice for me to go out and, and have a, a place like that where i know what i'm talking about when i visit with people you know <laughs> <laughs> i think that's most custom bootmakers i think that's just that's just part of the trade yep <laughs> got another question here um uh, kind of uh, bouncing around a little bit here. Um, and that's what's nice about Ask the Bootmaker. So if you guys have any questions, get them in now because we're running out of time here with Dina. We got one from Carol Burgess up in Canada. What is your favorite hide to work with? I like kangaroo. 
that's my go-to leather. And I don't, I'm not particularly, well, I'm okay with Italian kangaroo, but I really prefer what they used to call bilby. It's, it's the matte finish kangaroo. And that stuff is just so nice and so easy to work. And it, it form fits to your foot so well. It's so comfortable and nice to wear and so easy to work with. So that's my leather of choice. I've never been a real fan of exotics. I own one pair of ostrich boots and one pair of croc boots. And the croc boots are the only crocs I ever made. <laughs> uh, I've always liked making my boots exotic with the design and, and using the, the leathers that are, are really nice. And surprisingly enough, kangaroo is, is pretty, pretty wearable. You know, it wears pretty well uh, compared to a lot of stuff, you know. Every time I talk to a boot maker, it seems like they say kangaroo every time. And um, I always remember Dustin Lau's answer because he said, you know, uh, God put kangaroos on this earth to make cowboy boots. <laughs> well, I don't know about that, but it is my leather of, of preference for sure. One of my other favorite leathers that I like is, is just a matte finish runk and shoulder uh, for a heavier work boot. And, and that stuff, for as heavy as it is, works just about like kangaroo. You know, so it's, it's one of my faves. My dog is barking at the door. <laughs> oh, no worries. We love it. We love it. Got another question here from uh, Nina. Uh, we talked about favorite leathers. We got to talk about favorite colors now. She wants to know what's your favorite color. Oh, I don't have a favorite color. I never really have. There's so many. How can you pick a favorite? You know, uh, I didn't used to care much for green, and now my uh, tastes have changed some, and now I like green a lot. You know, but uh, to me, it's just it, I, it's when I see it. You know, and and that's another reason I love going to Wichita Falls because you can go and paw through all that leather there. You know, and uh, one year I was there. And I, I found some green ostrich, some kind of olive green ostrich. And dang, if I didn't find some a top leather that was exactly the same color. So I take it back. I have two pairs of ostrich boots. I forgot about that one. Uh, but uh, it, they made a beautiful pair of boots. Uh, they're, uh, you know, this olive green ostrich, and I use bone kangaroo for the inlay. And mm. it was a pattern that my dad designed from a, a carving pattern for a, a carved top pair of boots, but I used it as an inlay pattern and, and then did the carving uh, uh, accents with stitching. So Ooh. they turned out to be a nice looking pair of boots. No doubt. I love olive uh, leather, olive, olive colored leather, especially uh, with ostrich. It's just uh, classic. I wish there was more boots out there with, with olive, using the olive color. Yeah, it's... it's the. I've noticed over the years, particularly the last like five years, uh, leather is changing a lot or, or the what's available to us. You know, gosh, there for so long, we had just beautiful colors in kangaroo that you could get. And now it's kind of backed off. So, so many of the, the tanneries required the, the wholesale places to buy, you know, a thousand skins of each color or whatever that they wanted to buy. And a lot of times it was just too much. They didn't feel like they could sell that much. So we're having a hard time getting some really pretty colors of leather these days. And I, and the quality of leather is not quite as good as it used to be. So I hope that somewhere in the industry, somebody figures that out and starts stepping up a little bit. <laughs> It seems like kangaroo isn't quite as pos uh, isn't isn't quite as popular as it used to be, um, maybe 20, 30 years ago. It seems like maybe ostrich has taken its place more and more. Uh, yeah. Do you see that too? Yes, and I think you know I I don't know exactly what it is. You know, uh, people really love their exotics. You know, uh, and there's a few exotics that I just refuse to make. <laughs> Because I, well, I don't make elephant because I think they're sentient beings, and I'm not mm -hmm. going to make a pair of boots out of one. I do have some hippo boots. They're a little, you know, they're a little meaner. Yeah, they're mean. 
<laughs> so you could get away with it with that. Yeah, you can get away with that one. Uh, what other leathers won't you use? Uh, oh, Stingray. I made one pair of Stingray boots in my career and it broke all the needles while I was trying to sew it on and everything. And I had a couple of beautiful maroon skins that I was going to make me a pair of boots out of. I made that one pair for a customer and I sold. <laughs> so I was like, I'm not making any more of these. <laughs> Yeah, because they got all the little uh, bones on top of the skin, mm -hmm. right? And lasting them, they don't stretch. I mean, you know, golly, it was just a nightmare. And I was, they last forever once you get them made. But geez, you know, uh, you'll break half your needles in your drawer. <laughs> That's terrible. <laughs> <laughs> well, Dina, thank you so much for spending time with me today. I had a blast talking with you. I know everybody really enjoyed uh, watching this conversation or listening to this conversation based off of the uh, comments and the questions that we had in the live chat. Thank you, everybody, for asking those questions and for uh, watching or listening today. Uh, Dina, can you close us out with uh, where, where people can find you? I know you're still taking some students. Uh, while you are trying to sell your shop um, and uh, whether somebody is looking for you uh, to to buy the shop or to um, order a pair of boots or um, to enter your uh, schooling as a as a student uh, can you give us a little bit of a, a a closing out with where people can find you well uh like I say instagram is a good place and i also have a, a facebook page McGuffin Custom Boots, Facebook. Um, and I live in Albuquerque, New Mexico. <laughs> you can Google me and find me there. Uh, I don't generally give out my contact info right on, on everything, but you know, you can get a hold of me through Instagram and, and Facebook instant message, and I will get back to you that way. And uh, that's how you Perfect. do it. Perfect. That's Call how it's done. <laughs> All go. online. Gotta love it. Thank you so much, Dina. Uh, have a spectacular rest of your day. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in, and we will see you next time. Thank Cheers, you. everybody. Bye.